Well, as I said a moment ago, we are at the end of the church here with uh, one Sunday really left. And scriptures out of the lectionary, if you follow the lectionary, those selected texts over a three-year period, when we reach this time in the calendar year, they always are apocalyptic. They are eschatological. They're about the end times as Jesus, whether in Matthew or Luke, begins to make predictions. And they have fire and brimstone and all that going on, wars and pestilence. In fact, when I was preparing this sermon, I went back and looked at a movie clip by, from the book Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth. you remember that? 1972, it was all going to happen. Oh, well. It's not a subject uh, we really talk about much, nor do we like to, but it always comes up at this time of the year. And in a way, it's probably good because most of us try to avoid the thought that we are mortal, that we are finite creations, that no matter what the conclusion of time is, there is a time when our lives conclude. Jesus reminds us in his sayings today that all of us have only so much time. And it is important, no, it is really consequential what we do with it. And it's interesting to me that he chooses as the context or the setting for sharing this message, the temple at Jerusalem. Now, this is the second temple. Solomon built his temple. The Babylonians destroyed it. When they returned from Babylon, Nehemiah built a temple, but it was far too plain. It was cheap. And so when Herod comes along, Herod is going to rebuild it and make it right. But Herod builds it not as a monument to God, but really as a monument to himself. Herod is the master builder of Israel. He is an individual whose primary desire and concern was to rise and have the status and the power equal to Cleopatra and Julius Caesar, Egypt and Rome, the two great superpowers of his time which really is quite presumptuous when you think about it, because Israel, I'm sure, in the minds of Julius Caesar and Augustus the Great, was really more like Duck Dynasty than, than the housewives of Beverly Hills, right? And so, if you're Herod, how are you going to do this? You can't compete militarily. You cannot compete economically. Israel really is not an economic power. They really had no resources of significance. They were a trade route. How do you compete? How do you show that you are great, a king among kings? You do it architecturally. You do it in the ancient world architecturally. And so what Herod did was he invested his resources, his people, his money, everything he could into building structures that would be monuments to his greatness and on equal with those in other realms. And to, so to the north, on the Lebanese border, what is now the Lebanese border, he built his palace of Caesarea Philippi. And to the west, on the Mediterranean, he built the great city and hippodrome that went out into the Mediterranean of Caesarea, or as they say, Caesarea. And outside Bethlehem, he built Herodium up on a mountain, built the mountain so he could build a palace and fortress on top of it. And of course, if you know your history, there is that great fortress on the Dead Sea overlooking the Dead Sea of Masada. Great and mighty edifices, opulent and beautiful. And today's scripture is also one of them. Herod built the temple. A structure so impressive that it required a thousand masons, ten thousand laborers, and required nearly 80 years to complete. You can look at it on the front cover of your bulletin. It covered 37 acres and was comprised of stones weighing as much as 160,000 pounds and standing 100 feet tall. The only thing left today is the Western Wall. 
They were incredible structures, never to be matched again in Israel. Incredible structures for their day. But you know, the question comes into my mind, why do this? I mean, really, why, why would you do this? Why would you invest all this time and this energy to do it? I understand that Herod wanted monuments to his glory, and without a doubt, he had a goal of playing with the big boys. But really, why does anyone who has that kind of power and that kind of influence and that kind of prestige and wealth, why does anyone get caught up or carried away with these big, flashy things? Why does that happen? Why does that seem to happen? Why does that still happen? Why did Herod do it? My conclusion was, Herod did it, bottom line, simply because he could. I mean, isn't that what happens when we have the resources and we have the finances? We do things simply because we can. Certainly, Herod didn't do this to improve the quality of his people's lives. I don't think he had that in mind at all. I think even the temple was about politics and cozying up to the Sadducees. It isn't built as evidence of his love of God. It was built because he had the ability and the resources to do it, so he did. Herod did whatever he did for Herod. And you know what? The interesting thing, by the world's standards, by the standards of his day, he was a success. In fact, in history, he is not simply known as King Herod. He is known as Herod the Great. And yet, if you read further, Herod's life ended in misery, literally decomposing. His life ended in misery, and none of the things he built lasted. In fact, 80 years building the temple, and two years after it was completed, the Romans totally destroyed it. Not one stone left on another. And you know, it's interesting, I looked it up at... At, at today's dollars, the temple cost between one and two billion dollars. And yet, when it was all done, it was just done. Gone. And so, when we read these particular sayings in Jesus, what we get caught up in as he stands in, in the temple area and he talks about the end of the world, we usually get caught up in the end of time message. We get caught up in the fire and the brimstone and oh my gosh, it's going to be coming. The futuristic predictions. But what I suspect Jesus is really talking about because, you know, Jesus says of that time only God knows. I think what Jesus was really talking about was not so much some time in the future. I think he was saying to those people listening to him, you've got to think about the time you have now. Herod used the time he had now just for himself, which in the end left nothing enduring. So by standing at the center of one of his personal monuments and predicting the fall of it, Jesus is really asking them, okay, what are you building these days? What are you building with your life? What does your life stand for? What do you use your re resources for? How do you invest yourself? And will it be something of enduring and lasting quality? Will it make a difference in the long run? Or is something that just two years from now will be wiped out and gone? I really think that's the point that Jesus is asking those people. Look at this temple. I mean, look at our church. The hurricane comes along and we are toast. Are we not? I'm not even sure there'll be sand to build on if something comes. I mean, it's an awful thing. But you think about it. These things are all temporal. What is it? The church helps us to do what we need to do, but the church building is not the church. As Bill said, you are. What do we invest in? What do we stand for? What is enduring and lasting? Anybody here... Anybody here ever held a garage sale? I guess that's an amen. How about up here? Garage sale? Anybody had a garage sale? Yeah. You know, um, I was thinking about that today. And, I, you know, we, a garage sale, we go and we dig these items 
out. Bill, you can use this for your children's message, I'm sure. <laughs> but you have to pay me 10 cents for it. Um, uh, here's a sham wow. You'll say wow every time you use it on your car, as seen on TV, right? Um, I'm not sure. This is my wife's, but I'm sure I didn't see any purpose in it at the time. But anyway, here it is. That, that, you're still using this, right? So this hasn't made it to the garage sale yet. But. Um, oh, I found some other really, really valuable things in here. Um, let me see. Oh, you can't live without these, right? Uh, uh, Ferrante and Teicher, We Wish You a Merry Christmas LP album. <laughs> And John Denver, I want to live. Oh, who couldn't live without John Denver? There's a useful one. Um, and, you know, so we have these things in your attic, and there's some of them, you know, you really wonder, you wonder why you ever bought them in the first place. <laughs> right? <laughs> ever moved? Downsized? Anybody here done that? Sold your house? Same way, isn't it, as you weed through all the stuff? Some of which holds really good memories. But much of which lends itself to asking, why did I ever think I needed that? Jesus once told a story about a man who was so successful, he had to get a storage unit to hold all his stuff. He built a barn stuffed it full. And the day it was done and stuffed full, he died. Which really brings us, I think, to the core of this text. At least, it's how God spoke to me through this text. That Jesus calls us from a life of means to a life of meaning. I want you to see the difference in that, because we are a people of means. We are. But what we lack in our culture is meaning. People are struggling for meaning. They got the stuff, but the stuff isn't doing much for them. You know, Jesus calls us from lives of means to, lives, to a life of meaning. That is, from doing things or accumulating things like Herod just because we can to doing things because we must. And the must is derived not from a sense of guilt or obligation, but a passionate desire to serve and help others, not by merely improving the quality of lives, but by widening and deepening the depths of our spirits and our souls. We underestimate the value of doing that. In his book, Keeping First Things First, Steve Covey says this is accomplished through what he labels as the law of the farm. The law of the farm, which is really simply you reap what you sow. But what he says is, uh, you know, if you're going to reap what you sow, if you're going to farm, it takes time to put the seeds in the ground. It takes time to nurture them. You have to weed them. You have to take care of them. You have to harvest them. It takes time. And we live, he says, in an age of cramming. Farming, cramming. And cramming is what we did in college when we had a final exam and we hadn't gone to class all semester. And he said, you know, we're very successful at cramming. In 24 hours, we can learn the whole course, pass the test, and get the grade, but not learn a thing. We passed the test, but failed the material. We live in an age where this is the norm, not the aberration. As we cram as much into our existence as we can, avoiding thinking about the seeds we are or are not taking the time to plant for the future. What people lack these days is not the means, I would submit to you, but the meaning that gives purpose and satisfaction in their lives. And as Jesus says, what good is it to gain the whole world if you lose your soul? Now, 
The other day I was listening to an interview, it was very impressive, 24-year-old young man, Alfred Morris, he plays running back for the Washington Redskins, soon to be the Washington Bluebirds. Anyway, he's very successful, he's in his second year, has a very good contract with them, and he drives a 1991 Mazda, which was the heart of the interview, because he gets a lot of grief for driving a 1991 Mazda. He, he says he drives up to the stadium, and he's parked next to all these sports cars with all the guys he plays ball with, and he's had people come up to him and say, are you the custodian? You should move your car. But he drives the car that he bought, when he was in college from his pastor for two dollars. His pastor gave him the car for two dollars. It's in the news now because even Mazda couldn't stand it. They had to, had to put a new interior in it and had to put a new engine in it and had to do that for him. But he drives the car, 24 years old. He says, I drive it not because I can't buy something else, but just because I can buy something else doesn't mean I have to. He says, driving that car reminds me where I've come from. Wow. I'm not a Redskins fan, but I just might become one. You know, it reminds him where he's come from. And it begs us to ask, where do we come from and where are we going? Which is determined by what we invest in today. And the question is, are we investing in things of timeless significance? Or are we investing in things where the warranty expires in one year? Because the truth is, and I don't like to think about it, but the truth is that someday my life on this earth will end. It is a fact. But an accompanying fact is the fruit of my labors need not end. They can endure. And Jesus says that the time to think about this is not someday, but this day, because this day is really the only day that we have. This day is the only day we have, and Jesus says in this text, don't ever forget it, because this day and how we use it matters. Amen.